evening. I'm James Lipton. Like the iced tea. And you are watching Inside the Author's Mind. On A and E. Throughout the next hour, we will be traveling on a journey through the mind of the eloquent and incomparable Aldous Huxley. He's the author of such novels as Chrome Yellow and Island, but his most famous work is, without a doubt, Brave New World. During the course of the next hour, we will be speaking with him about Brave New His feelings about the novel and the true meaning. Here is Aldous Huxley. Welcome, Aldous Huxley. Well, thank you for having me. No problem. Let's get straight down to business, Bray. New world. Yeah. Hmm? You wrote that? Yes, I did. I didn't read it. But I heard good things. Tell us a little about it. Okay, well, uh, basically, the novel takes place in the future. I took a satirical approach in the novel to give my points of view across where I think the future is leading us. Uh, of course, my views are not as extreme as I present them in the novel because uh, it is a work of fiction. So as I was saying, the novel takes place in the future after a one-world government has risen to power. It takes people's freedom as we know it today and instead gives them happiness, or rather the illusion of happiness. Um, the government is based on the belief that fear and intimidation have only limited power and are not necessary. Instead, the government uses SOMA, a mind-altering drug. Whenever a person in society becomes irritated or possibly stressed out, they're, taking a, they're told to take a SOMA. Uh, from the earliest age, all children begin thought conditioning, which is a process they are taught, and uh, rules and morals are taught to them in their sleep. This keeps help everything, uh, everyone on track and thinking on the same wavelength, and most importantly, they don't challenge society. Children are taught, for example, from an early age that a gram is always better than a dam. Everyone gets their own ration of, so of soma so that society stays intact. There is also a caste system in this new world. There is no jealousy or feelings of superiority in this caste system. This is because the people are not divided into social classes as we would usually uh, view them today. Uh, it's not by natural selection, of course. Uh, people are literally manufactured in bottling plants through a process called Balkanovskification, which consists of a series of arrest and development in order to separate the people into classes. So, in the embryo stage, some bottles are deprived of food or light, and then subconscious persuasion is used in order to not only inhibit them physically, but also mentally. So, um, the cats are divided into five groups, alphas being the highest, epsilons the lowest. Uh, there's striving to, there's no striving to achieve a different status because everyone is happy with their own social class. And uh, nobody questions anything because they're programmed otherwise. Epsilons, for instance, cannot even read, yet uh, they're happy in their mindless jobs being sewage workers or lift men because that's all they know. So nobody questions society, therefore nobody is unhappy. This is the basis of society in a brave new world. Fascinating. Now that we all have a clear understanding, Please tell us the message you, Aldous Dog Huxley, were trying to convey in your novel, A Brave New World. There's no straightforward message I was really striving for in writing this novel. It's just although there are many different themes and messages entwined within the story. In a world where there's no war, poverty, or crime, where you're programmed from birth to do everything, can you possibly be truly happy? That's just one question that the book raises. Uh, Bernard, the main character in the book, is unlike most of the other people in society. He is an alpha, the highest caste group, yet he does not resemble other people in his caste. He is short, skinny, and opposed to the well-built beautiful friends of his, who are also alphas, he's not proportionate to them. This fact that he is different physically causes him to question society and eventually become different mentally. He begins to admonish the social order of things and becomes very spiteful towards people for not understanding his uncertainties. Bernard strives to be truly happy, but realizes that he has done nothing for himself his whole life. What is there to be happy about? So, uh, everybody's happy nowadays, he states. 
we begin giving that to children at five. But wouldn't you like to be free, to be happy in some other way, in your own way, not in everybody else's, for example? Bernard tries to stimulate the minds of his friends, only to hear them regurgitating the boring nonsense that they have been fed since birth. The novel brings out the points, what is happiness without passion? How can these people truly be alive if all their decisions are made for them in advance? There can be no happiness without first pain and suffering. This gives way to passion. To feel truly satisfied and passionate about a subject or a job you completed is an unparalleled feeling that these people will never know. Without the horrors and pain of real life, there is no happiness. Because what do we even have to compare our base or happiness on? Happiness is only an illusion for these casts. Death is viewed as just another aspect of life. Nobody mourns the passing of another's life because nobody is that important in society. There is no marriage, there are no mothers or fathers or siblings. Everyone belongs to everyone else. If you would like to be with a certain go girl or guy, you ask and then it happens. There are no relationships between people as we commonly view them today. Almost all things that could cause happiness in our lives, or we may think make people content, has been stricken from civilization. Bernard is not truly happy and he realizes this and he meets somebody else who feels the same way. Wow, that's good stuff. Those are some crazy ideas. <laughs> Men and women having sexual relations with whoever they want, whenever they want. I like that. Oh yeah, so anyways, how can a society like this even survive? Seems as if there are so many flaws once you look past the surface. Well, that's a question that's evident throughout the whole novel. How does the society continue to thrive? Bernard and his friend John, who he meets uh, that has similar views as him, eventually asks this question to the, to the leader of the government, Mustafa Mond. Although he has similar views as Bernard, and John realizes the necessity for order in society, he gives up his questions and his views in order to provide the illusion of happiness for everyone else. Of course, the leader is a brilliant man who loves art, science, his learning, a complete contradiction of the people he controls. Bernard and John get heated, hit in a heated debate with Mond over which is better, the way society is now or a world with free will, religion, and earned respect and self-satisfaction. Mond argues, you've got to choose between happiness and what people used to call high art. We've sacrificed high art. Art is one of those things people must do without in this brave new world. Without pain and suffering, art is not an issue. They get on the subject of God and religion and ask how the civilization could exist without something to believe in. And then Mon retorts, you can only be independent of God while you've got youth and prosperity. Independence won't take you safely to the end. Well, we've now got youth and prosperity right up until the end. So what follows? Evidently, that we can be independent of God. It seems that the society works so well because all human emotion and feeling is taken out of everyone. Only humans' basic and shallow needs are accounted for, which keeps them happy because it fills the only level of necessity they know. Christianity without tears, that's what Soma is, claims Mond. So the civilization thrives because it lacks all evils of our world. There's no pain except in a strictly physical sense. War is gone. Love is a word which holds no meaning for them. Although freedom, happiness, and passion are dead, there seems to be no need for them. The society amazingly coexists without them. This is not enough for Bernard and John. They dispute but I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. Once they had had a taste of how exciting the world could be, no dose of Soma could change their views. Bernard acts as the middle ground between freedom and slavery. John has been free all his life, and Bernard admires him for that. Yet Bernard has been a slave until recently. The main point argued in this novel is that to be free and to have a free life, unfortunately, requires pain and suffering. The choice is for society. Which is better, this brave new world, or to be free, yet to take the sweet and sour as they come? Well, that's very interesting. I think I would like to read this novel. Hopefully society will never experience a world without freedom. So, all you have to do is ask a girl, and then you may have her. That is great. That is good thinking. No wonder this book is so popular. Well, it's been a pleasure listening to you. We are all aware and enlightened because of what you have said, thank you. I'm James Lipton, and this was inside the author's mind. Aldous Huxley.